Listen, I need you all to listen. Listen closely. Life is based off of decisions. It's not about what you're dealt, it's about how you deal with it. In every situation, you must keep your eyes and your mind open at all point in times. Your decisions are what pave your destiny. Fuck what anybody says about you, fuck what anybody does to you, it's how you deal with it that matters. You are all gods of your own. You are all gods. You are all geniuses. You are all stars. You are all super fucking stars. You are all the greatest beings in the fucking planet. You just have to make the right decisions. And that's all that matters. I love you all, and thank you for having me. This is my fucking dream. I love you. I love you all. Good night. Good night. Developing right now a search for a killer in South Florida after an up-and-coming rapper is shot dead. 20-year-old Jasse Onfroy, known as rapper XXX Tentacion, has died. <laughs> Jasse Onfor was born on January 23, 1998, to parents Dwayne and Cleopatra in Plantation General Hospital in Florida. Although Jasse was healthy, the doctors would notice a problem with his heart, a defect known as a hole in the heart. And although it's common, it didn't mean Jasse grew up being told not to play too rough and would only grow to be 5'6". He spent the first year of his life living with his dad and his dad's girlfriend Tashno Freeman and Jasse's half-sister Ariana. Ariana would go into a lot of detail about Jasse's early childhood, but the videos on our YouTube have since been deleted for unknown reasons. But here's what we know. After being born, Jose would visit between his mother and father's home until finally settling in with his dad at 817 36th Street, West Palm Beach. This was in March or April of 1998. He was in a Jamaican family, very inspired by their roots and traditions. Being Jamaican means earning and having respect first and foremost. Jamaican parents often hold their children to greatness. Ariana's mom would be the one to take care of Jose and Ariana for over a year, while his dad provided the income mainly from selling drugs, doing music performances, and odd work on the side. Dwayne always said his son was beautiful, and he always wanted attention as a child. He would cry until he would be picked up, and then he would go quiet. Ariana remembers this is how Jose was. It was like this for less than a year until some dramatic changes in the real path of Jose's life began. Sometime in 1998, Jose's dad had an affair with another woman, having a third child with a third mother. It was only a few months after this video was filmed that Tashno would have enough and call Cleopatra, Jose's biological mom. She asked her to come take her son and they would meet at a gas station. From there he would be taken care of mainly by his mother. This didn't mean he didn't have a connection with his dad and Ariana though. They were often visiting on the weekends and his dad would babysit when needed. His dad loved Jose, and he tried to provide for him even with the new living arrangements. But this meant most of the time, Jose was with his mom living in Pampano Beach. She was a single working mom as a stripper and couldn't always take care of Jose, since he demanded so much attention. She often sent him to babysitters or his grandmother Colette Jones' house. Sometimes her brother, Jose's uncle, would be over days at a time and he'd watch Jose. When he needed attention most growing up in his adolescent life, Cleopatra often had different guys over and gave little to no attention to Jose for how much he needed. Although she took care of him the best she could, she was having internal problems of her own, with Dwayne leaving, being stressed with relationships, and taking care of Jose. He never blamed her. He loved her his whole life with deep respect and admiration. In elementary, his mom made sure money came first, and always took care of that for Jose. As long as he had clothes, food, and a place to stay, she thought she was providing the love and attention he needed. He was mostly the outcast kid because of this, but he had some friends, just different from other kids. He was either respected or feared. Everyone knew Jose didn't like bullies and he would stand up to them, even if it was for other people. He wasn't afraid to be himself. However, sometime in 2004, 2005, when he was 6 or 7 years old, two significant events that shaped Jose's future for the worse would happen. Although Jose and his uncle were around each other often, it wasn't always a good thing. His uncle was known to suffer from depression and have outbursts. Sometimes during these outbursts, he would take it out on young Jose, and he would get physical with him. Jose being young, he didn't understand at the time why this was happening. One day while he was at school, his uncle would have an outburst, but this time nobody was around to witness it. Unfortunately, he would take it out on himself. When Jose came home, he was the first one to discover the tragedy of his uncle hanging from the balcony. This event would only feed Jose's anger and depression even more. Just months after this tragic event, one of the guys who sold drugs and was seeing his mother had been over the house. Him and Jose's mom had a heated argument, but this wasn't really uncommon in the household. Jose came out of his room when he heard dishes being broken in the kitchen. The argument quickly grew out of hand and the man got physical with Jose's mom. 
Jocelyn claims the man would have killed his mom, but he interfered. Rand grabbed a piece of broken glass from the dishes and jumped on top of the man, biting his flesh anywhere he could, as hard as he could, and cutting him and poking him with the glass. This was the first major outburst Jose had shown, and it was a tipping point. After this, Cleo tried to pay more attention to Jose to make sure he wouldn't behave like that again. Over the next year or two, he would soon be leaving elementary school, and would increasingly hate being home when she wasn't there. He loved his mom and always went out of his way for her attention. He chased her in his own words. But slowly things went back to their old ways, and Cleo fell short of her promise to give Jose the attention he needed. My mom was going through it at a young age, so she wasn't really able to be there, and it wasn't her fault. She got pregnant again and would give birth to Jose's half-brother. The next years of elementary school into middle school were spent having his aunt babysit him when his mom was gone, and visiting his dad on the weekends where they would go out to eat or the movies. His father was pretty active in his life until this point, but he ran into trouble with the law in January of 2008. Jose's dad had met a man who wanted to buy marijuana in bulk. It was later revealed that the man was an undercover DEA agent. They agreed to sell 800 pounds of marijuana, with Dwayne making the connection along with a few others. A full surveillance team had an investigation and seized over 500 pounds of marijuana. He was arrested with seven others and held in jail for two months before being indicted on March of 2008. The trial would last until 2009. He was sentenced to nine years in prison for money laundering, conspiracy, and drug trafficking. Jose's dad was a prominent figure in Jose's life, and he provided stability. And just like that, he was gone. Jose started sitting online all day with the laptop he got for Christmas, just talking to people and interacting, something he continued to do for years. Around 2009, 2010, Jose was attending Margate Middle School. It wasn't the best school, but it was the perfect fuel for his rage built up. When he wasn't playing PlayStation or Xbox to distract him from the evil shit in the world, he was getting into fights. Bro, I've been fighting since I was a kid. This eventually led him to get suspended and then kicked out, but he had stopped caring about report cards or school in the 6th grade. He had completely failed this year, even though he got straight A's the year before. Him and his mom argued over things like this because she wanted him to do great academically and go on to great things, but Jose knew that wouldn't come from schooling and being a well-behaved student. Jose is who he is because of being himself, and his mom didn't understand that part of him. He changed dramatically from 2010 to 2011. He changed his style and his clothes to something more similar that he liked. This was the beginning of a transformation from pretty boy to something unique that represented him better. After he was held back and eventually expelled from Margate, he transferred to Lauder Lakes Middle School in the 7th grade. He really started to develop his style and taste into what he liked. Odd Future being one of his inspirations. He always had a few friends or girls talking to him. As he says, he was always friendly unless you did something to him. The only subject Jose actually enjoyed was history. Everything else about school just led to more fights. There's something about fighting that Jose loves. He fought for people who couldn't fight for themselves, but he also fought for fun and the thrill. He also admitted to fighting just to get the attention from his mom, because he knew she would have to give him attention after a fight. But over the years, the strain was getting to be too much for his mom. She would take him to stay with his aunt or friends for extended periods of time. When his aunt saw that Jose was interested in music, she wanted Jose to perform in the church choir. But at one of the recitals, once again, he fought one of the band members who Jose said kept bugging him. He even beat another kid with drumsticks. His outbursts were taking a toll on everyone around him, especially his mom. Over the next year when he was finishing 8th grade and going on to high school, his mom would officially kick him out, but still try to be part of his life. He was drifting homeless and talks of this time as feeling lost. Jose ended up living with his grandmother Colette Jones who took care of him the best she could. She lived in the Owls of Inverary, a gated community popular for drug dealing and gang activity. He met kids in the neighborhood who were older but he was just about to be a freshman. He was bouncing back and forth between staying at his grandma's and some of his friends' houses he had met in the community. His grandma was very religious. She would wake him up for church on Sunday mornings. She had a curfew for him, and if he wasn't home, the door would be locked. He avoided staying there as much as he could and preferred to stay at other friends' houses in the complex. He got into selling weed and taking drugs. He was feeling extremely suicidal. Weed would make him paranoid, so he did drugs like Xanax and Vicodin to numb himself. Most of these nights for Jose were spent just finding a place to sleep, trying to forget the world's problems for a night. But these problems would be small compared to what was coming. Please enter your jail number at the top. Please clearly state your first and last name after the town. Jose, on for us. Thank you for using Global Tail Link. Your call is being processed. 
In late 2012, when Jose was 14, he was stopped by officers one night who had found 21 grams of weed on him. He was indicted and shortly after charged with the felony. As a youth, Jose was sentenced to one month in juvenile detention and a mandatory six months in a behavioral correction facility. Jose turned 15, finished his sentence, and was released. Within a month, he would be arrested again for breaking into a home with several others to steal laptops. It's unclear what he was charged with, as Florida's sunshine laws prevent juvenile records from showing personal information. What we do know is he spent some time in jail again. This is where he would meet Stokely. We met in jail. We met in jail. And the last met in jail started rapping together type shit. Stokely had been locked up for minor drug charges, and he went to Piper High School in Sunrise. The same high school Jose would transfer to after he did his six months in the behavior program. While locked up, they would talk about how they wanted to hit licks and come up on some money. They even joked about rapping together and would freestyle for fun. This was the same time when Jose would beat up one of the problem inmates who was transferred into his cell a few days prior. He would later speak on this in his famous No Jumper interview after homophobic allegations came up years later. Right after getting out in early 2013, he was enrolled into Sheridan Behavior Facility. They worked on helping the troubled youth. For an unknown reason, he was kicked out at some time and he didn't want to return to finish it. But he eventually would, and he actually gave recognition to them, saying he did enjoy his time there. He would complete his six-month program and start high school at Piper in late 2013. Piper High School was a come-and-go school with many people and many faces. There were fights and violence, and Jose's friends would try to keep him out of trouble. But this is Jose. He would fight for any reason, and being in high school, this was only more often. They turned into every week, but slowly what would start to take up more of his time was talking with Stokely about rapping. They picked up where they left off with their conversation. They decided they should make a crew, or something like a group, whenever they hit licks. This was the start of their group very rare. One of their friends named Aaron had a snowball microphone and a laptop with recording software on it. It was like a snowball mic. It was like the cheapest mic you could get. It sat on like three prongs, Audacity, and like a laptop. That's how we got distorted music. We actually started making the distortion like to the best of our advantage. So we used distortion in our music. They decided to rap because they enjoyed it so much. And it was an attempt to stay out of trouble. They wanted to make songs as a group, so they had all written down stage names for themselves. Jose was the last one to pick one, but he had narrowed it down to a few options. He tweeted to one of his old friends that narrowed down some of the names he liked. His friend tweeted back, are you serious? They're unique, but do you really think they would be a good stage name? Jose replied, I don't give a fuck what others think about the name. It's what I want. Stokely went with Ski Master Slump God, and Jose would go by Master Splinter, but shortly after changed it to XXX Tentacion. X was the only unknown numeral that he didn't know at the time, and Tentacion was Temptation. Together they made Unknown Temptation. Although they were still up to no good after school, they really started to consider music as a way out. The group started writing their first songs and would record them whenever and wherever they could. One of their first songs together as a group was Palm Trees. The reason the vocals are so quiet in the song is because they all ditched class and went to the computer lab to record it. X went online and created a new SoundCloud account and uploaded this song. Palm Trees was the first song he was featured on, but his first ever solo song was named News Slash Flock and it recently resurfaced on the internet. After Palm Trees, X began taking music more seriously. He started learning how to use music production software like Audacity and FL Studio. Slowly, he put together a few more tracks. X's friend Mitch Feck helped him transfer the songs from SoundCloud and organize them onto an EP that was released on Datpiff as Ice Hotel. X often got inspired from Japanese animation, and he would carry this aesthetic in almost every aspect for years to come. X began having conversations with the very rare group, asking them how serious they were about this rap shit. He wanted to make sure everyone around him wanted it as bad as him. He continued to slowly release music on SoundCloud but would often later take it down, like his The Fall EP that was released at the end of 2014. X began recruiting new members to the group, but unfortunately the group's friendship began to strain. X and a group member named Nyora would get into a fight, and X and Ski Mask would leave the group to form a new one. As of right now, nobody's in very rare except me. Deadass. They named it Members Only. At first, the group only consisted of X and Ski Mask, followed by Absent Will, who became X's first manager. In 2015, they dropped their first tape, Members Only Volume 1. It consisted of songs exclusively by X, Ski, or the both of them. The songs all had a dark and gothic feel. X was starting to find his avenue of music, and he ran with it. Shortly after the tape dropped, they started planning their next one, this time hoping to find more members to feature on the songs. They began recruiting rappers from their local hood and the South Florida hip-hop scene. Jossie brought together a compilation of artists that is it, is big. It's, yeah. it's phenomenal, bro. Just I never seen nothing like this. 
As they began performing at small shows and house parties, they started to meet more people in the Broward music scene. They were finally starting to gain a small following after people heard just how different their music was compared to other music out of Florida. The unique thing about Members Only was many of them didn't rap. In fact, X never minded this. He stated as long as everyone was doing something to progress the group, whether it was booking shows, doing artwork, or even making clothes, you had a spot on the team. The group grew to a substantial size of rappers, photographers, videographers, and clothing designers. When booking shows, X often got into it with promoters when he would request 20 people on his guest list. He really wanted everyone to eat. Members Only Volume 2 came out about 6 months after Volume 1. This time the tape featured more artists like Flyboy Tarantino, Enzo, Fuck It, and even a verse from the unknown Smoke Perp. This was a really important time in X's life. He began to see how his behavior, which through his entire life stunted his growth, was finally beginning to benefit him and his crew in the form of his music. Although he was starting to see the benefits of this behavior, it didn't mean his life was any easier. In fact, he was still fighting and getting into trouble. The group was starting to get recognized as the rowdy kids who started fights. One fight in particular would be filmed and uploaded to World Star Hip Hop, giving X his very first taste of going viral. This behavior, among other things, ultimately led to him being expelled from Piper High School. Even though his SoundCloud following was still small, his Twitter had a few thousand followers as a result of the fight videos. He would try to tweet all of his followers and get to know them, networking and making new friends every day. X began to enjoy the idea of figuring out social platforms and how to utilize them to his advantage. An early example of this was him removing songs from his SoundCloud to create a sense of scarcity to his music. Almost immediately people began to search for these lost songs. X would later quote he hoped one day his lost music would be searched for and traded around like Pokemon cards. Too much of anything is a horrible thing. None of nothing like if you don't if you don't supply and there's a heavy demand, when you drop anything or you give out, it's gonna mm -hmm. skyrocket. According to Google Trends, it was the summer of 2015 when his name started to circulate the most, and locals were starting to know about him. At this point, he could guarantee a few thousand plays every time he dropped a new song online. With X at the forefront of the group, they began getting paid a little bit of money for their shows, and people in Florida stated they were so infectious that soon after, other aspiring rappers throughout the region were trying to emulate them. In late 2015, X and a producer named Rojas had become acquainted while sitting around Absent Will's house. Rojas was showing X a few of his beats, but X was passing on all of them. He was looking for something different. The last beat Rojas showed X was co-produced by Rojas and Jimmy Duval, and it was intended for another artist named Rechi P, but he had been locked up, so Rojas considered the beat up for grabs. X liked it. He went into the booth in the closet, and 15 minutes later the song was finished. He would title it, Look At Me. For a generation of kids on the brink of the worst mental health crisis in decades, X's music spoke to them. Much like how he stood up for the kids at school who couldn't help themselves. He wanted to be the voice of the youth through his music. And after the song came out, everything started to change. Like shit, this shit fire. And then, you know, a couple days later, this shit just blew the fuck up. Rojas uploaded Look At Me to a SoundCloud page. And in January of 2016, it got its official release for digital download. It was immediately turning out to be X's most successful song at the time. Although the song wouldn't chart on the billboard until the end of 2016, it slowly amassed millions of plays on YouTube and SoundCloud over a couple months. X's social media followers began to rise rapidly. While this is happening though, the police were building a case to put X in prison for robbery and assault from the year before. With his name circulating the underground and a cult-like following, he would be requested multiple times by his new fans to appear on the up-and-coming No Jumper podcast with Adam22. At the time, the podcast was still somewhat small, but it was catching a lot of attention for its underground artist interviews. X's interview would be a groundbreaking moment in his career, but some of the comments he made would later on come back to cause controversy. This is around the time he was dating a girl named Geneva, and they would quickly move in together. He states the relationship was perfect at first, but he admits this was a bad time in his life where he felt insecure and alone. Although things would quickly go bad in their relationship, he states she was always there for him through a tough part of his life. I lived with my ex for like a, a couple, like almost almost a year. I was literally going insane, and she was my safe haven. Like I would go to her. She was what I wanted. She was she was everything for me. Shortly after X was booked for his 2015 robbery and assault charges, he was held at Broward Regional Detention Center in Fort Lauderdale. He would be held for a few months before agreeing to house arrest. Look. I look like a cyborg, dog. Get off my leg! Upon release, issues with his girlfriend Geneva would get worse after she admitted to sleeping with another man while he was away. 
These events would later form the allegations of domestic violence between the two. In October, he would be arrested once again for these allegations, and he would plead not guilty, but was still held for violating his house arrest. He would stay locked up for over six months. While behind bars, a combination of the allegations against him, along with the start of a beef with rapper Drake, would inevitably bring his name in front of a whole new audience. After Drake released a song titled KMT in early 2017, fans immediately noticed it carried a very similar cadence to X's Look At Me. Okay, okay. After word spread online of the similarities, people began to check out X's music and Look At Me began to chart on the billboards. Unfortunately, he would have to hear about this from behind bars. He later pleaded no contest and was released. Wasting no time, he began doing interviews and capitalizing off of his beef with Drake. With all eyes on him, he started to work on his debut mixtape, Revenge, which would mostly just be a collection of re-released songs. The tape would peak at number 44, and in June, Members Only Volume 3 dropped. He spent most of 2017 releasing music and capitalizing off of the attention he was getting. His charges were still pending from his ex-girlfriend, but the trial kept getting pushed back. After dropping his debut album 17, he had gained a mass following and was breaking out of being considered underground. The album gave fans a real insight to his mind and his struggles. His message was received by fans that they were not alone in this battle. The album shut down all talks of X being a one-hit wonder, and other major artists began to co-sign X and recognize his wide range of talent. He was being considered the voice of the new generation of kids, and he began to make efforts at what looked like change for the better. So I'm trying my best to escape that realm of mind and that realm of thought in order to evolve into not only a teacher, but just someone to, to motivate the youth and to push the youth in a positive direction. I know how it feels to be around people and feel alone. Like, I'll be around a million people and I'll like still feel alone. He would take the 10th and final spot of the 2017 XXL Freshman, which was a fan-voted spot where he would win by a long shot. In October, he would ink a record deal worth well over $6 million with Capitol Records. But shortly after, he would go online to tell people he wasn't releasing any more music. He said, I'm tired of being mentally abused for trying to help people. I'm tired of the hate. I'm done. While this is going on, he would donate $100,000 to domestic violence prevention programs, as well as plan to host an anti-rape event in Miami. In December, a Christmas Carol EP dropped and his team would also submit documents signed by his ex-girlfriend that stated she wanted to drop all charges against X. But this request was denied and he was booked for seven new charges, including witness tampering, stating they believed he coerced her into signing the papers. He was released five days later and put on house arrest until his trial. He was allowed to go to the local studio during this time because of his obligations to his record label. He continued to strive for a more positive life. He would often go live to speak to his fans and try to leave them with positive messages. Um, I'm just waiting for them to take the ankle monitor off. They said they were only going to keep me on the ankle monitor for like two months. But I'm not uh, supposed to be on the ankle monitor much longer. Like I said, if you guys ever want to speak or if there's ever anything that you want to say to me or even just to vent my Instagram DMs or my Twitter DMs. He launched his YouTube channel and began vlogging and connecting with fans through it. He also started his Helping Hands Challenge, where he would go to different schools and donate items speaking to the kids about their future. He released his song Hope, which was dedicated to the school shooting survivors and sent his condolences. He began recording music for his second album. The album was released on March 25th, 2018, and it was titled Question Mark. XXX Tentacion would make SoundCloud rap history as his album debuted at number one on the charts. His single Sad reached number seven, giving him his first ever top 10 song. 